Good morning. My name is Pastor Josh. I'm the lead pastor of Wintergreen Legends Church of God in Akron, Ohio. I'm so glad that you are with us this morning. Uh, you may notice that this is a different setting than we typically have our worship services, but due to some technical difficulties with the audio and the live stream, I am re-recording this morning's message from the McConnell household. So welcome to my home and I am so excited to have you, whether you are a member of our uh, of our church or whether you are just checking us out for the first time. Uh, welcome, and I am excited for this time. Uh, I'm going to open up the message with a prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this time. We thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you for the ability to dig into your word. We're so thankful this Independence Day, Lord, to just to be able to freely worship you and study and learn about you and also lord to be able to just freely and safely be able to share your word with others lord bless this time may you use it for your glory for your purposes in us not just for teaching but also lord that you'd use it to change us and equip us and to move us and inspire us, Lord, to go out and effectively be your witnesses, your hands and feet. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, I'm excited to follow up on the sermon series that we started a few weeks ago entitled Anchored, where we are looking at some of the basic fundamentals of the Christian faith as we're looking at what is it that we as Christians believe? How is that rooted in God's word? And what difference does that make? Why is that important? And that's key. It's important. Not just that we are gathering information. It's not just about education, but ultimately if we're not putting that into action, if we're not applying God's word, then it, it doesn't have that power in our lives that God has called us to dig into it, to study it, to apply it, and also share it with others. So this series is intended to be able to equip you to better understand the Christian faith so that you can more faithfully apply God's word in your life, as well as so you can more effectively share that with others. So we launched this sermon series by looking at who is God and asking, you know, that question, who is God and why does that matter as we looked at the character and nature of God. And so this morning we're following that up by really looking at one of the most perplexing aspects of the Christian faith, and that is the doctrine of the Trinity. And we're in this, we're asking, you know, what is the doctrine of the Trinity? What does it even mean, and how is it that God can exist as three and yet one? So what does that mean? How does that work? And also, what difference does that make? And that's a lot of times people think of doctrines like the doctrine of the Trinity as just being something that, you know, the academics or the the, the biblical scholars, the theologians, uh, sit around and make up, and so they have something to fight about, or so they have something to write lengthy books on, uh, to be able to exercise their creativity and, and to be able to philosophize on Christian-related topics. But what we'll find this morning as we go through this message is that the doctrine of the Trinity matters, that it is vitally important in our lives as Christians, and that it sets the Christian faith apart from any man-made religion, any man-made God. There, this is a distinctive of the Christian faith. So we will look at why that matters as we go through this. Uh, I want to begin this morning by just offering a very brief description of what the belief of the, the Trinity is, what this doctrine is. And very simply, it is this belief that there is one God that exists in the three equal divine persons. And it's not that God evolves over time and starts as one and then adds a second and a third person and who knows, you know, what he'll look like in a thousand years, but rather that, that God, the Christian God that is revealed in Scripture and God's Word is a God that has eternally existed in three divine persons. 
but yet there is only one God. So that's essentially the, the concept of the Trinity boiled down in a concise way. And we'll talk about how that works and also look at where we get that from scripture how we how we uh, arrive at that conclusion from scripture and i want to take a moment here to just very clearly say at the outset the word trinity actually does not appear in scripture and so you may ask well if it's central to the christian faith if it's central to our doctrine how could it not come from scripture how does that make sense well it, the actual word is not in scripture but the concept is very clearly laid out not just in one passage that the clever theologians have twisted and made out to mean something that it never intended to to mean or communicate but rather we'll see that throughout scripture we have very clearly painted that this portrayal that god has given us of himself as being one god that exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So with that being said, we are going to be uh, just looking at how God has revealed himself as not an evolving God, but as a God who has eternally existed as triune, and that is three in one. So we're going to begin by looking at the creation account itself, uh, the first uh, the opening chapter of Scripture, Genesis 1, 1, in which we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. So here in the opening of Scripture, the very first chapter, just in the in the second verse, we read of the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of times people think of the Holy Spirit as a New Testament addition, uh, you know, a New Testament concept or evolution that oh, we don't see the Holy Spirit until Acts chapter two at Pentecost, but that is not not the case. When we actually dig into God's Word, we see the Holy Spirit being active and involved. Uh, from the very opening of Scripture. Um, likewise, I also want to point out also in the first chapter of Genesis that is important to this, to this topic, to this morning's message, is that we also see in Genesis 1.26 that God uses the first person plural language with reference to himself. In Genesis 1.26 it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image in our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air over the livestock and over all creatures that move along the ground and so you have to ask who is god talking to first of all this is before the creation of man who is he actually talking to and then secondly who is he referring to when he says let us make man so we know that only god creates and it is man that is made in god's image not in anyone else's or anything else's image. And so for God to say, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, it only makes sense within the framework of the Trinity that God exists as one God in three persons and that God here is speaking to and with reference to the other members of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And that's the only way that we can make sense of this opening passage that we see in the creation account in the first chapter of Genesis. So with that, I, I want to kind of go through and just talk a little bit about each of the three persons in the Trinity, God the Father, God the, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God the Father is the is is the person of the trinity that is is most often uh most often uh, thought of in in terms of the new T the old testament so we see god revealing himself to his people that we see him giving his people his law his his teaching his commandments and and showing them 
that who he is, that he is holy and calling them likewise to be holy and giving them his law to protect them from sin as well as to accurately represent him and shine his light to the other nations. It's not just about Israel, but actually what we see is that he has called Israel to be his people to have his law, to be able to reflect his truth and his character and his nature to the rest of the world, that God has called and loves all people who he has created in his image and calls his people to live out in a way uh, that points people to him by reflecting his character and nature. So, God, that is where we see God the Father in the Old Testament is revealing himself, calling people, giving his word, his law, calling them to be holy for he is holy. And we also see God as the sender. He sends the Holy Spirit. He sends his son. And so that is uh, the God the Father and how we see him work and move in the Old Testament and really in scripture again in in looking at uh, in the new testament he's sending his son and sending uh, the holy spirit uh the holy spirit is active and involved in scripture since the very first chapter like we just saw in in genesis 1 verse 2 uh, but beyond that too we see that the holy spirit also throughout the old testament is falling on on special individuals on prophets priests, kings, on special men and women of God, and empowering them to accomplish certain tasks for a limited time. For instance, we see the Holy Spirit falling mightily on Samson to do some amazing things. Likewise, we read of the Holy Spirit falling mightily on King Saul for a time. And so we see that the Holy Spirit is not just a New Testament person of the Trinity, but actually that the Holy Spirit has existed from eternity past as a person of the in the divine Trinity, that he's been active and involved and engaged, and uh, that he has uh, led and guided and inspired and protected and provided for, and also empowered and changed from the inside out. God's people from the beginning of time. So the Holy Spirit is, doesn't come into being in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, but that we see the Holy Spirit being active from eternity past, being an active integral uh, part of the, the, the Godhead, the triune God. Likewise with God the Son, we see that Jesus does not come into existence in Mary's womb, but rather that he is the eternal Logos, the eternal word through whom all things were created. So again, it's not that we have God the Father in the Old Testament, and then once Jesus comes on the scene in the Gospels, that, oh, now we have God being two in one, but then in Acts chapter 2, now we have God being three in one. But no, God is unchanging. He didn't uh, evolve or grow from being just the Father to being the God, the Father, and Son, to being God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but that God has eternally existed as triune. So it's, it's vitally important that we see that John, the Apostle John, who witnessed Jesus firsthand, his life, his teaching, his ministry, his miracles, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, that the Apostle John opens up his biography on Jesus, the, the Gospel of John. He opens it up not with Jesus in the womb of Mary, not even with the genealogy of Jesus, but that he rewinds the tape of time all the way back to the beginning, to creation itself actually even to prior to creation. In John 1, 1, John intentionally uses the same verbiage of the creation account in Genesis, in the beginning. So let's read John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. 
through him all things were created. All things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So John makes it very clear here that the Son of God, the uh, Jesus, that he is not, he did not just come into existence in Mary's womb, but rather the, the, the focus of his biography has no beginning at all, that he actually created all that exists. And if we stop and, and consider the verbiage that he uses here, that is very obscure when John says that he was with God and was God. He was with God and was God. And what in the world does that even mean? Is he with God or is he God? And, and the answer is yes. But that only makes sense within the framework of the Trinity. If God exists as a triune, cohesive three in one God, that is the only way that makes sense of this, that uh, God exists from eternity past as three in one. Let's continue on in the opening of John's gospel, starting in verse 11. He, again referring to the eternal Logos, the Word, the Son of God, He came to that which was His own, but His own did not receive Him. Yet to all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. So the Creator of the universe came to that which was His own. He stepped into His own creation even though they didn't receive him, they didn't recognize him. But Jesus comes onto the scene not as a new being, not as a new person, but he comes into that which he began, he created and started. And that he gives us the right to become children of God. Let's continue on in verse 13. Children not born of natural descent, nor human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling amongst us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So John makes it very clear, and he, I love that, how John uses also the first person plural here, and he says, the, the word, this eternal word, the eternal logos, the Son of God, took on flesh and dwelt amongst us, and including himself, that he walked with me, he taught me, I ate with him, I touched him, I saw him, we we witnessed him firsthand. This is not the old telephone game where John heard from someone who heard from someone who heard from someone, but rather that John was a firsthand eyewitness. And so were some of John's initial readers who he's writing this to. So that is significant how John says that this eternal word that created everything took on flesh and walked and lived amongst us. And that we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. So that Jesus is not a new person, but that he is taking on flesh and dwelling amongst us. Even though his own don't recognize him, but that he is here. And that we have seen the one, the glory of the one and only. And so all of this only makes sense within that framework of the, the Trinity of God existing three in one. But here I want to pause for a moment and just come back to this question of what difference does this make? Why does this matter? Maybe you've already found yourself asking that as I'm going through this and, and maybe saying, well, I thought this was going to, to tie back into our lives. And, and so I want to stop and, and, and come to that question before we continue on in, in, in learning more about the, the, the Trinity and seeing that um, really being rooted in Scripture. And, and so why does that matter? Well, first, it matters because it 
really solidifies for us this idea that God is unchanging, that he doesn't evolve and change. It's not that, okay, God's word tells us who God used to be, who he once was, or who he was when scripture was written, or who he was at the time of creation, but we see that God is eternally stable, eternally reliable and faithful that we can truly cling to him and throw our anchors into him who he is and who he has always been even in and especially in the storms of life as our boat is rocking and shaking and falling apart but he does not change even as everything else does he is unchanging and reliable and faithful and that he doesn't evolve and become three in one but that he always has been it also gives us the doctrine of the trinity also tells us that god is both the sender the sending god but he is also the god who goes see the the, the trinity gives us god the father who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, the doctrine of the Trinity gives us the God the Father who says, I so love you that I am willing to sacrifice my son for you to be reconciled with me, to be saved and redeemed and rescued. But it's not just this distant God of the skies who says, okay, you, you, son, you know, you go deal with this. I, I'm not going to get my hands dirty. I'm not going to go down there. And it, it's not this disconnected God of the skies who just sends someone else. But also the doctrine of the Trinity gives us this picture of a God who not only sends, but also goes. That Jesus says, for this reason my Father loves me, that no one takes my life from me, but that I lay it down on my own initiative, and that I take it up again. See, Jesus lays his life on his own free will initiative for us. So in the doctrine of the Trinity, we have both the sending Father and the going Son of God, who so loves us that he lays down his life for us while we are yet sinners. But beyond that too, there's more to it than that, that not only is God the sending Father and the going Son, he's also the Father and Son who send the Holy Spirit to be with God's people, to guide us, to direct us, to empower us. Jesus tells his disciples in Acts 1.8, prior to his ascension, he says, when the Holy Spirit falls on you, you will receive power to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And that is exactly what we see happen in Acts chapter 2 and throughout Acts and even in our lives that the Holy Spirit goes with us. You know, Jesus promises to say his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. I am going away, but I will send my spirit to you who will be with you. And so uh, when we, the doctrine of the Trinity gives us, yes, God, the father sending this Jesus, the son going, God, the father and the son sending the spirit, but also the Holy spirit who is with us, who falls on us and walks with us through the darkest of times, the most broken of times, the most desperate of times and places and scenarios that we find ourselves in, that the Holy Spirit empowers us and teaches us and inspires us and guides and directs us, gives us wisdom and walks with us. So again, the, 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 the concept of the Trinity gives us a God who is intimately involved in our daily lives, not just the God who sits back at a distance, who creates and then crosses his arms and watches everything fall apart from a distance. But the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit gives us a God who cares about us, who has a plan and a purpose and who walks with us and pays the price for us. 
connected with that, the, the doctrine of the Trinity also matters. The third reason I want to give you this morning, because all of our hope, all of our faith falls or stands on who Jesus is and what he accomplishes. If Jesus is just a nice guy, if Jesus is just a wise man, if he's just a miracle worker or a magician, if he is just an unfortunate guy who is mistreated, his sacrifice is not sufficient to cover our sins, to wash us clean, is not sufficient to reconcile us with God. Our hope, our faith is in vain. It's for nothing if Jesus isn't who John tells us he is. And Matthew and Mark and the rest of Scripture. If Jesus isn't the eternal Lagos, if he isn't pure and holy and perfect, the spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, which we read in John 1.29, then our hope and faith is in vain. And so, yes, the doctrine of the Trinity matters, and it applies to us in our lives. But here, I, I want to make sure it's very clear. So I've gone through and talked about the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but I want to, I want to share very clearly that we are still talking about one God. God is very, very specific and careful to tell his people Israel, that he is one. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, the beginning of the Shema, what the, the Jews refer to as the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. And likewise, in Isaiah 45, verses 5 and 6, God says, I am the Lord, and there is no other Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising sun, the rising of the sun to, this, to the place of its setting, men may know that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. So God is very clear throughout scripture that there is only one god that we're not talking about three separate gods but that somehow in the mystery of the trinity god is father son holy spirit from eternity past and yet he is one god and i want to give i've given three reasons thus far why the doctrine of the trinity matters that god is reliable unchanging that he is faithful dependable we've talked about who jesus is and what he accomplishes we talked about a god that is inner that is involved in our lives and goes with us but fourthly i also want to point out that only in the trinity can there be an eternally loving and relational unchanging god who creates not out of emptiness, not out of need, not out of loneliness or brokenness, but who creates from his fullness. See, that there is something about every man-made God that, can, that makes them all very similar, is that they are all needy. They are all like man because they're made out of the image of man. That, you know, other world religions... Talk about gods who create because they need laborers, they need servants, they need slaves, they need people to do their bidding, things that they can't do. They create because they're lonely. They're, they, they have no one to be in relationship with, no one to love or be loved by. That is not the God of Scripture. He does not create to take. He does not create because he needs he creates out of his fullness to give, not because he needs someone to love him. He has been eternally in relationship with Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They have been in loving relationship since eternity past. 
And now I've already I've already quoted when Jesus said, The Father loves me because I no one takes my life, but I lay it down on my own and take it up on my own. Uh, but also we read as well in, in John chapter 17, verse 24, Jesus says to the Father, You have loved me before the creation of the world. Before the creation of the world that you have loved me. And this makes sense of this, this intimate relationship that we see in Scripture between Father, Son, Holy Spirit. When Jesus tells his disciples that he's going away in John chapter 14, and he says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you in my Father's house, and you can't come with me yet, but I will come back for you. And Jesus tells them, you know the way, and they respond by saying, what do you mean? We, how, we don't know the way. We don't even understand where you're going. And there are, they're concerned. And Jesus responds in John 14, starting in verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have uh, and have seen him. And Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. You know, is it, so Jesus so intimately connects him with the Father. He says, for one, you can't get to the Father except through me. I am the only way there. But you know the Father because you know me. You've seen the Father because you've seen me. You can't have the Father without me. And this is similar to Jesus' words to his critics, to the Pharisees, when he says, you claim to be children of God. You claim to be children of Abraham and and thus, children of God. However, you have rejected me who the Father sent. So therefore, you have rejected the Father. You don't have the Father. You're not children of God because you've rejected me. You can't have the Father without me. And so there's this, this intimate relationship and connection between the three. Let's read on in John chapter 14 verse 9 Jesus says don't you know me Philip even after I've been among you for such a long time anyone who has seen me has seen the father how can you say show us the father don't you believe that I am in the father and that the father is in me the words I say to you are not just my own rather it is my father the father living in me who is doing his work. So again, the, this intimate connection between the three. You can't have the Father without the Son. When you receive Jesus, you're in a relationship with the Father, and you also have the Holy Spirit. As we already looked at in Acts 1.8, when Jesus says the Holy Spirit will fall on you, and not just fall on you and have a relationship with just you, but rather that that the Holy Spirit will empower you to be my witnesses to the end of the earth. So there's this connection that the Holy Spirit is testifying to the truth of the gospel message about Jesus and empowering you to share him effectively. So again, it's a three for one deal. Uh, but having said all of this about the Trinity, I have to stop to recognize that it is difficult to wrap our heads around how God can still be three and yet one. And for this reason, historically, analogies have been used to help us to better understand how this could all work. And so uh, there are so many analogies out there, and, and, and no doubt you've probably heard additional ones uh, that, I, that I'm not going to reference this morning, uh, but some common ones are, you know, the apple that you have, this, the apple core, the flesh, and the skin of the apple, but there's only one apple. Or there's the roots of the tree, the trunk of the tree, and the branches of the tree, yet there's only one tree. Or uh, the egg, you have the yolk, you have the white, and then you have the shell of the egg, but only one egg. Or one of my favorites, the cheesecake. You have the crust, you have the filling, and you have the topping, but you only have one cheesecake. But with all of these examples, they all fall, 
they all fall short because they all divide a whole into three parts, none of which are are equal to the whole. And that's not quite how this works with God. It's not that we talk about God being all-knowing. It's not that God the Father has 33% of the knowledge and then the Son has 33% and the Spirit has the remaining 33% uh, or, or that they divide up their power in such a way that none of them is omnipotent. But when you put them all together, then now they are. But rather that each of them are fully all-powerful, all-knowing, eternal, holy, perfect, pure, just, righteous, that all of them are God. But yet, somehow, the three of them make up one God, and that's the mystery of the Trinity. A different a different analogy, a different kind of analogy that's given is the analogy of the man, where we have one man that who can be a son, a father, a husband, yet is only one man. But really with that, in that analogy, we're looking at one individual from different perspectives, seeing them in different lights. But that's not quite the picture of the Trinity that we see in the New Testament. It doesn't make sense of the scenarios where we see all three members of the Trinity interacting. Like, for instance, in the baptism of Jesus, you have Jesus in the water with John, who's baptizing him. You have the, the sky opening up and the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus as a dove. And you have God the Father saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. You also have Jesus directly calling God the Father, Abba, Daddy, and talking to him directly and in, in prayer. And that doesn't, those scenarios don't make sense of the, the analogy of just the one man seeing him in different perspectives and different lights. But so I, I will say that all analogies will fall short. And to be fair, no analogy is designed to be a perfect representation. They're just limited illustrations of, of a more complex thing or entity to try to make it easier to understand. So to be fair, any analogy when pressed hard enough will fall apart. But I will say in particular with God, there is none like him, like God tells his people in the Isaiah passage we read, that there is none like me. It's not that you can say, well, who is God? And give me five examples. There is no other example that perfectly represents God other than God. So any analogy will fall short when pressed too hard. But I, I, I'm not going to tell you, well, don't you look to analogies as ways to, to help. I just want to say you have to recognize their limitations. Uh, but uh, what I want to say is, if you're struggling to still wrap your head around this, it's actually a strength and not a weakness of the Christian concept of God. Because when we're talking about God being the creator of all that exists, all space, time, matter, everything, we're talking about a God of all wisdom and knowledge and perfection, and he is holy and perfect, a God of all power. That we have to, like Job, just say, I can't fully comprehend your greatness. And maybe I thought I did. Maybe I thought I fully understood in all detail. But God, you are so much bigger and greater than, you know, we try to often try to make God smaller and squeeze him into a little box to make him easy to understand. And Yet God is greater than that. And in, in, in recognizing that I am limited in my ability to fully comprehend and grasp how great God is, that is what we would expect of a God of the magnitude that we claim to believe in, a God of the magnitude of Scripture. And when there's a level of, of saying, you know what, God, I trust in your faithfulness. I trust in your in who you are and that in your honesty and your truthfulness and that you have represented to us in your word that you are three and yet one. And that there are many reasons why I can see that we've talked about this morning, four different reasons we've talked about why that matters and why that sets the God of Scripture apart from any man-made God. 
And so there's a, that helps us to as we wrestle with wrapping our head around this, this difficult concept. Um, but if you're still saying, well, but how do in the world do I share that with other people when I still have questions or I don't understand, I can't answer every question that someone else would have. Well, I want to respond to that with a brief analogy. And that is, you know, in in thinking of myself and in, in one of the areas of of my of my experience that, you know, I, I actually worked in the wireless industry uh, for, for many years, almost 15 years. I, I, I was a store manager for, for Sprint. I actually was, uh, it, I was selling uh, cell phones and, and managing and supervising other selling uh, phones and also uh, even technicians who would take phones apart, rebuild them and also troubleshoot, do basic troubleshooting on network. Uh, and I, I was in that industry when 3G launched when 4g launched when we have 4g lte 4g ebdo uh, i i i i i have a level of understanding of wireless technology however if you were to transport me in time put me in a time machine send me back a thousand years and and actually give me the task of explaining sufficiently the cell phone the wireless wireless technology and what it is and how it's possible to someone up a thousand years ago, I could not sufficiently explain or defend the possibility of this technology, you know, to to their to any critic satisfaction. I couldn't make my own cell phone tower, cell phone network. I couldn't begin to. And you think about what it even sounds like that. Hey, I can instantly talk to anyone in any part of the world. We can see each other face to face live and have communication. We can share concepts and ideas. The whole concept of wireless technology of the internet uh, or trying to talk about the uh, the car the automobile or the an airplane that you can travel across the world not just uh, you know and not with that not with the aid of a horse or a chariot but flying through the air they would think we're crazy trying to explain that but yet even if i was incapable of explaining in great detail these different technologies uh, my faith in the truth of that would still be valid and still be warranted because of my extensive experience that i had had with these technologies i don't fully understand how my car works but I still rely on it and have faith in it. And I still believe that it makes sense that there is, it is understandable. I just don't fully have all that, that information. It's not my expertise. And so uh, I can't answer every question about the automobile or about the phone or about the internet or about electricity even. But my faith is still warranted uh, and I can still have a level of confidence a legitimate level of confidence in sharing that information because of the experience that I've had. And our faith in, 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 in Christ, our faith in God is in his word is similar that, you know what, I can tell you that the God of scripture is real. And I can tell you that he is trustworthy because I have experienced him firsthand. Like John said, he lived with us. He dwelt amongst us. I have seen him, the glory of the one and only. That we, we got God's word from firsthand eyewitnesses. And that God is reliable and he has represented himself to us as three in one. And even if we struggle to wrap our heads around that, we can have confidence in who he is, in the reliability of his word, in him who we have firsthand experience with in our lives. So I hope that that helps to make sense. It certainly didn't answer every question, but my point is that even with still having questions, that you can have confidence in your faith and be able to share that even if you can't answer everything. So I hope that that's helpful to you this morning. 
And, uh, you know, I'd love to connect with you further if you're just checking us out and uh, or you're just interested in this topic and found us on YouTube or on Facebook. Uh, I'd love to, to, to continue the conversation, to pray with you. And you can check us out at wintergreenledges.org. You can also email me, Pastor Josh, at wintergreenledges.org. I'd love to close out our message with a prayer. Lord, we come before you and thank you so much for your word, for your reliability, for being the God we can cling to and rely on and depend on through all time, that you are who you've always been, and we can trust who you've represented yourself to be. We, we thank you for being the God who's intimately involved in our lives, who cares and loves us, that you called us, that you've sent your son to die for us even while we were yet sinners, and that you are the Son of God, who took on flesh and laid down your life for us and took it up again, and that you've offered us your salvation through that sacrifice, that we have the ability to be children of God, to have a relationship with God the Father by accepting the Son that you've sent, and that by doing so we also receive the Holy Spirit, who is our advocate, who is there with us to walk with us through the difficult times in life, as well as in the happy moments and the victories, and the mountains and the valleys. Lord, we love you. We praise you. And it's in your name that we pray. Thank you for joining us this morning. Have a blessed weekend.